Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all so much for coming out to um, give us some feed, hear about and give us some feedback about our next two year operating and capital budgets. My name's Ed Riskin. I'm the Director of Transportation with the SFMTA. Um, and very glad to see you out here this morning. We were actually, given the drought conditions that we're under, we were hoping for rain, also hoping that would have uh, brought more people out, but uh, I'm especially appreciative for those of you who did choose to come here. It's a beautiful day outside. I know there's other things that you could be doing, uh, but your feedback's really important, so I appreciate you taking the time to come. I'm gonna try to go through a presentation uh, fairly quickly. Um, it's information that, uh, that has been out in the public realm uh, a number of times before, including at a couple hearings at, at my board of directors, so that I can leave as much time as possible at, at the end for your feedback, for your questions, comments, recommendations. Uh, the purpose of this meeting and the others that we've had is really to make sure that you understand uh, what we're faced with fiscally and so that you could give us some recommendations on how to get to a balanced budget, uh, which is our requirement and goal. So I'm gonna, I'll quickly walk through this presentation and then the rest of the, the time is yours. So this is what we're gonna cover. I'm gonna, uh, just a little bit about the agency and our strategic plan and what we're doing and then really get into the budget and we'll uh, let you know kind of what the process is moving forward. Uh, I th think you're all probably fairly well familiar with our agency. We're somewhat unique in the country in terms of the range of services we provide and responsibilities that we have. We obviously, as I think everybody knows, we operate Muni, which is the nation's seventh largest transit system. We also do transportation planning and engineering, parking and traffic management, bike and pedestrian safety. We regulate the taxis here in San Francisco. So it's a, a lot of different services. Uh, with uh, Muni alone, we deliver a tremendous amount of service. We have a lot of assets that we're responsible for maintaining, not just the Muni buses and trains and all their associated infrastructure, but all of the stop signs and traffic signals, all the paint that's down on the streets, um, the parking meters, parking garages. So the, there's a a fairly broad scope that is all the context that we're talking about here today. Just wanted to start out really with our strategic plan. The board of directors of the SFMTA adopted this plan, I guess it was about two years ago now, and it was meant to guide the agency over a six year period, three fiscal cycles, because we do budgeting every two years. And it, uh, the strategic plan is meant to be a document that guides what we do as an agency. As I said, we have a, a lot of different responsibilities, very broad set of responsibilities, so I thought it was all the more important that we have an organizing framework within which we make policy decisions, operating decisions, resource deployment decisions, uh, all of which really roll up under budget decisions. So the, this is the f a small excerpt from that strategic plan. Uh, the, the vision is San Francisco is a great city with excellent transportation choices, and meaning we want to make sure that there's lots of good options for people in terms of how they get around the city. We established four goals in support of that vision, uh, the first being safety. The number one thing that we want to do as an agency is make sure that the transportation system is safe, no matter how you're choosing to get around. The, the second goal is essentially the, the goal that would actualize the city's transit first policy, which is a policy that was adopted by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors 41 years ago. Um, we are now charged uh, in the charter with executing that policy. The third goal has to do with the role that we in the transportation system play in impacting the environment of San Francisco, the quality of life, the economy of the city, um, which because we are a small, dense city, the transportation system plays a large role with regard to those things. And then finally, the fourth goal is about our own workplace, <clears throat> about our employees, about making the agency a great place to work, about making it an effective organization so that we can achieve those other three goals. So that's the frame within which we look at everything we do, and most importantly, the budget. 
So w with regard to the plan, uh, some things that we have been doing or are doing to advance the plan, uh, the, the, the core of the agency is the muni service that we provide. Uh, just this morning, uh, we're hosting the, the last of a series of workshops on the transit effectiveness project, uh, which has been a kind of first in a generation effort to look at the entirety of the muni system and figure out how we can make it uh, work better, be more efficient, uh, move more people more reliably, more quickly. We've also been investing a lot, uh, not so much money, but energy and effort into communications, communicating with riders, communicating with the public. We have a text alert system, email alert system. We have a very active Twitter feed. Uh, we have rebuilt our website. So investing a lot in making sure that muni riders, that customers, that people use our services uh, have many different good ways of getting information and providing feedback back to us. And what we're doing right now is about the fiscal management of the agency. Uh, today we're talking about primarily the two-year operating capital budgets, uh, but we do start our capital planning <clears throat> looking much longer term, looking at a 20-year time horizon, identifying all the needs that we would have over those 20 years to take our current assets, to bring them into a state of good repair, to anticipate uh, additions that, that we mean may need to do enhancements to the existing bike, pedestrian, transit, taxi networks. From that 20-year financial plan, uh, we develop a five-year capital improvement program, and then what we'll cover a little bit today, the two-year capital budget. And then the, the operating budget, which is really the, the, the main thing we're here to talk about, uh, we're right now in the process of developing and finalizing that. The, the, the other modes of transportation are very much complementary to transit and to the realization of the transit first policy. So we've been uh, st working hard to make improvements in the taxi service, getting more taxis in the, on the street, uh, improving some of the amenities and services that they provide and make them easier to access. We've been advancing the bike and pedestrian strategies, which are geared towards making those networks safer. We've been hearing a lot in particular about pedestrian safety lately, a lot of good progress that we're making as a city in that regard, but a lot of very necessary progress because <clears throat> we have far too many people getting seriously hurt and killed in our streets as they're just trying to walk around the city and that, that shouldn't be. So there's a, a lot of good work from these two strategies <clears throat> aimed primarily at making the city safer for people waking, walking and biking and making those modes of transportation more attractive uh, for at least some of the trips that people make to get around the city. And we've been working hard to improve how we engage with the public as we're rolling out new programs, changing existing programs, uh, developing capital projects. We're completely reworking the way that we engage with the public so that we can do so in a much more collaborative way, in a way where we can receive feedback so that we can adjust uh, any plans or programs or ideas and benefit fr from all the good input of the people who use the services, who use the streets, who live and work in the city. So just th those are just some highlights of things we're doing to advance our strategic plan. So on, on to the budget. The budget, I think, as, as everybody uh, pretty much knows, is, uh, is basically a policy document because it, it governs how the resources that we have are going to be spent over, in our case, the next two years. We do two-year budgeting uh, for our agency. So uh, the budget is basically made up of the, we look at the revenues that we anticipate coming in. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what some of those are. The main categories, we look at the expenditures, what it's gonna cost to provide the services to maintain our assets. And then we need to bring them together and balance them. And, and that is uh, what my task is under the charter to, to present to my board a balance budget proposal uh, that they can then uh, weigh in on um, and eventually uh, send on to City Hall for, for final approval. So this is the operating budget from a revenue perspective. It's the, the, the two different uh, circles show the two different years. Uh, the order of magnitude is about $950 million annual operating budget. And the, the main revenue sources, about a quarter of the budget comes from transit fares. 
Uh, and this is not just the Muni budget, this is the entire agency budget. Muni is, a, you'll see on the next slide, Muni operations alone is, is more than half of the budget, but the transit riders pay for about a quarter of the overall MTA budget. The general fund, uh, we have in the charter a provision that's a formula that directs general city tax revenues to the transportation system. That accounts for about a quarter of the revenues of the agency. And then about a third of the revenues of the agency come from parking. And that's from parking meters, it's from parking citations, it's from parking garages, and it's also from the city's parking tax. The off-street parking lots in the city pay a 25% tax. We get 80% of those revenues as well. So all of those parking revenues together account for about a third of the revenues that we receive. And then the, the balance, uh, there, there's some small things. The advertising that you see on the buses brings in some money. Uh, our taxi regulation, uh, there are permit fees uh, that, that bring in some money. We do get some operating grants uh, from the state uh, and also from the half cent sales tax we here, have here in San Francisco. The, the only part of the half cent sales tax that we use in our operating budget funds uh, the paratransit service all the rest of the sales tax money goes into the capital side, but th those are some of the other slices. But the, the, the big things are the general fund, uh, which comes via formula, the transit fares, which we establish, and the parking fees and fines that, that we establish. So there's some parts of the revenues that we can control, there's other parts that we can't. So that's the revenue side of the budget. On the expenditure side, you can see that, uh, that Muni accounts for the, the, the lion's share of the budget. Um, and then the, the other kind of main operating function of the agency is what we call sustainable streets. And that has many of the functions that used to be under what people knew as Department of Parking and Traffic. So that's where the bike and pedestrian safety work gets done, the, the traffic engineering, the parking control officers, um, as well as the the folks who maintain the traffic signals, the parking meters, the stop signs, the striping on the streets, that's within the Sustainable Streets Division. And then really all of the other divisions from finance and human resources, those are really all supporting Muni and Sustainable Streets. The, the Finance Division, which is the other uh, pretty good sized division, is where we manage our procurement, our information technology, our real estate, and of course all the budgeting and financing activities. And then you'll see one other big uh, slice which is agency-wide, and those are services such as um, insurance, such as some of our legal costs, uh, and also some of the services that we buy from the city that support the entire agency. So we, we, we pay for services of the city treasurer and the city controller and the city's HR uh, system, the city's technology. Uh, that's more or less what's in that slice. So that there's a picture of the operating budget, first the revenue side, then the expenditure side. So the numbers that I just showed you were baseline numbers. Uh, which, and baseline basically means taking uh, what we're currently doing and just really rolling it forward into the next year without really making any changes, uh, except for a few small things that we've assumed in the baseline, uh, which are these. We anticipate uh, some reductions in our costs uh, for legal claims and for workers' comp claims. Uh, we, we'd like to think that some of the efforts that we've been making to invest in the safety of the system are responsible for, the, for those numbers, for our being able to forecast that those costs will be coming down a little bit. Um, and then what we had been doing in the past is our board has adopted a policy that we need to keep in reserve an amount equivalent to about 10% of our operating budget so about 90, 95 million dollars now, available for kind of emergencies, for extraordinary events. In the past, during the recession, we had dipped into that reserve, so in the last couple of years, we've been refunding that reserve. Uh, now that it's back up to that 10% level, we no longer need to be putting 10 million dollars a year in, and that's been fed a lot uh, because of that general fund pass-through we get with the strength of the, and growth of the economy, a lot of the benefits of that flow right into our budget. Also assumed in the budget are, are things that we know about, um, and the, these are these. These are um, continuing costs associated with past labor agreements. 
uh, such as annualization of partial year raises, increases in fringe benefit costs and health and, and other costs that are going up uh, pretty significantly. Uh, the other big chunk is some contracts that we've entered into or agreements we've entered into over the past few years that were not fully funded on our baseline budget, uh, but that create obligations for us in the out years, such as payments, small payments to BART and Caltrain, uh, some other contracts that we've entered into to improve the services that we deliver. So there have been some adjustments. There's also $16 million uh, in the, both the revenue side and the expenditure side of the operating budget. Um, and these are uh, largely from development fees that during the recession really were just trickling in, but now that the growth is starting to happen again, are coming in a little bit more substantially, and we're showing those in the operating budget. Oh, and last, I, sh I should mention, because I know it's a topic that's of interest to some people, uh, we do buy a lot of services from city departments on the order of $65 million worth of services, everything from legal services to police services, as I mentioned before, the controller's office, the, the HR department, the IT infrastructure of the city we pay for. Um, and we assumed in our baseline budget a 5% increase um, just based on the growth of the costs of, of labor and services that they provide. So that's estimated in the baseline. What's not in the baseline, though, are uh, because in part we don't know what these are going to look like yet, are some of the things on this slide. Most significantly, we're right now uh, negotiating new collective bargaining agreements with the unions that represent the great majority of our workforce. We have about 5,000 people in the agency. Uh, probably more than 4,900 of them are represented by unions that are currently in negotiations. Uh, the outcome of that in terms of how much wage increase, how much savings, uh, we just don't know at this point. We actually won't know at the time our, our budget is submitted. Um, because of the timelines in the charter that comes after our budget submission. So that's not included. Uh, structural deficit, uh, it's a, a phrase that we use to describe things that we believe we should be doing commensurate with the level of service we're delivering. So example, for every bus driver and bus that's out there, you need maintenance mechanics, you need uh, the people who clean the buses, car cleaners, uh, you need fair enforcement staff, you need custodians to clean the facilities that they use, you need trainers, you need supervisors, and we don't believe that we have been resourcing those at the level we should for the level of service that we deliver. Uh, same when we're looking at the streets, if you look at the miles of striping that we have to maintain, the 12,000 signs that we have to maintain, the 1,185 traffic signals that we have to maintain, we don't feel that we've had the level of resources we should to maintain those um, that we do, that we need in order to keep them all into a good working condition. So when we're looking at the baseline numbers, know that we have not included any fixes uh, to that structural deficit. We, we were able to close that gap somewhat in the last fiscal cycle, but we haven't yet assumed any of those fixes in this budget. Uh, we, we have, I mentioned the work orders, which is uh, the, the phrase we use for the services that we buy from other city agencies. We haven't assumed any reductions in those. We haven't assumed any transit service increase, and, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. And we haven't assumed any other increases from the other operating divisions. For, for example, our communications division uh, has not been resourced relative to the size of the agency and the scope of what we do. Um, so there, that's an example of where we might want to add communication staff and communication services that we don't have today, but those are not assumed in the baseline. So keeping in mind everything that's in the base and that's not in the base, this is what the picture looks like. Right now, the baseline budget shows revenues that exceed expenditures, uh, which is great. On a 900-something million dollar budget, the, it, they don't exceed the expenditures by much. It's 22 million in the first year, 15 in the second year. But it's a far better starting point that, than we've had in, in many, many years in recent memory. Every, every year recently, we've been starting off uh, in the negative in terms of the projections for the baseline for the upcoming two years. So we're starting from a good point, but just want to kind of reemphasize that there's a lot of things that we want or need to do 
that are not included in those numbers. And for example, the structural deficit we estimate to be around $45 million right now. You can see here, if we tried to increase our expenditures by $45 million to close that gap, we'd, we'd quickly be in the red. So we're at a good starting point, but there's a lot of needs that, that we're going to be trying to address. So in terms of issues and opportunities, so what are things that we might want to think about changing in that baseline expenditure budget, either from on the revenue side or the expenditure side? First one I'll touch on is the FAIR policy. As I mentioned, the, the two parts of the revenues that we control are the transit fares and the parking fees and fines. With regard to transit fares, the SFMTA Board of Directors adopted a policy back in 2007 to index transit fares, and actually all of our fares, fees, and fines, to index them all based on inflation. Because our organization, uh, the, our costs grow over time as, as uh, labor increases come into place. Gasoline, the fuel that we use to fuel the vehicles gets more expensive. Insurance, health insurance in particular, gets more expensive. The equipment that we use to maintain our vehicles and our other assets gets more expensive. So the board adopted this policy to allow the fares to, to somewhat automatically, although they have to adopt the fare schedule every two years, to, to, to put, that, put it on a predictable course of increase uh, so that we wouldn't be in a position that we used to be in here at, at Muni and, and in many other city agencies where um, the fare stayed flat for a long time. We all remember the $45 fast pass, which was $45 for a really long time until the MTA found that we were in a big hole and had to jump it up to $60 in a single year. That was a really big increase. And this indexing fare policy is meant to eliminate those, to just keep things steadily increasing. Um, the, it is a formula. There is some rounding that happens. So the $2 single ride fare, for example, hasn't, uh, we, we only index that up in 25 cent increments. So up until this year, there hasn't been a need to index that up, uh, or I guess it has, rounded, uh, it has rounded down to $2. In this coming year, the indexing policy would, would index that up to $225. And the, the last point I just wanted to make here is that the, the voters gave us uh, authority in Prop A that was adopted in 2007 to issue debt. Uh, and that was based on a recognition that just using ongoing revenues to try to address that large asset base that we have of vehicles and rails and traffic signals, that that would be inadequate. So we got the authority to issue debt so that we could basically bond on future revenues so that we could bring more capital forward to invest in our assets now to get them into a state of good repair. Uh, so we've done that, and in order to do that, we needed to get a credit rating. And when we went out to talk to the credit rating agencies, they cited our, this indexing policy as one of the things that made us a financially strong organization that then in turn contributed to very strong, pretty strong credit ratings that in turn allow us to borrow at a, at a lower cost. So there's real dollar benefit that we get uh, as a result from, to this indexing policy. It's seen as, as, a, as a good practice and provides a reliable stream of revenues. So the default is that we let everything index up as per the indexing policy, but there are some things that, that we might want to consider with regard to deviations from that policy. Um, one of them is that there, we could increase certain fares above indexing based on the specialized nature of the service that they offer. A couple things that we have suggested, uh, the F-Line, the historic streetcars, uh, which at least for some people it is a, a specialized service, uh, almost akin to the cable cars. Um, one of uh, the recommendations was to increase that up instead of going up to 225, bring it up to three dollars, or, e or even four, or five, or six dollars for a single ride fare, leaving it uh, as um, as accessible via Fast Pass for those who have it. So, in other words, no impact if you have a Fast Pass, but if you're paying cash, uh, it would go up beyond the 225. Uh, I will say that we've gotten really strong negative reaction to that proposal, uh, including from my own board, so I don't think we'll be advancing that one. Uh, another idea, uh, express routes, 
uh, which make stops in the outer parts of the city and then express in, which get, get you uh, to where you're going a lot faster than your regular Muni route. One idea was to put some kind of uh, surplus or surcharge on those. Um, haven't gotten a lot of feedback on that. I'd be interested if any folks here have feedback. Um, and then finally, the visitor passports. Uh, these are one day, three day, or seven day passes uh, that are predominantly, if not exclusively, used by people from out of town. They use them a lot to ride the cable cars, but it's just an easier way than having to figure out clipper card or use cash. Uh, we, we, the idea here is maybe increase those a little bit beyond inflation, given the robust tourist trade we have here in the city. So th those are some p potential deviations with regard to increasing fares. Um, with regard to reducing fares, the, the mayor has, has called on all city agencies to look for ways through which we could address affordability issues, as you've all been reading and hearing and probably experiencing. We have somewhat of an affordability crisis in the city right now as housing prices and some other costs of living are really, uh, really going through the roof. Uh, so we've been looking at ways that, we, that, we, that the transport, your transportation budget uh, could help offset some of those other costs. So you, you've all heard of the free Muni for low and moderate income youth program. Uh, that was one of the things on the table that's actually now been funded, thanks to uh, the mayor making a deal with Google to pay for that for the next two years. So that's been addressed. Uh, what's still on the table is expanding that to 18 year olds. Right now our youth fairs are for kids five to 17. Um, many kids are still 18 when they're in high school. Some of the other transit agencies around the region uh, consider you to be a youth up to the age of 18. So extending the free Muni for low and moderate income youth to 18 is one idea. Expanding that to seniors and pe people with disabilities who are of low and moderate income is another idea. An offsetting idea to that would be increasing the discounted fare, which is currently a 67% discount, reducing it to be just a 50% discount for youth that are not low and moderate income, so higher income youth. And if we were to make Muni free for low and moderate income seniors and people with disabilities, then seniors and people with disabilities of higher incomes would pay half fare instead of one third of the fare would be a, a possible uh, complementary proposal to the free for low and moderate income folks. Uh, also, another affordability idea, we have a, what we call Lifeline Pass, which is a half, half price pass for uh, low income adults, and we could either freeze that, not index it up, or, actually, or even reduce it. So those are some of the ideas with regard to affordability. Uh, we had some others, such as removing the customer service fee that you have to pay if you go to our customer service center for a transaction, or that you have to pay to pay a parking ticket online, uh, removing some of those fees. Uh, some other ideas. And then the final fair idea is to, um, in, in order to encourage people to move from paper cash or coins onto Clipper, whether a Clipper monthly pass or just electronic cash on Clipper, uh, a proposal to let the paper cash fare increase to 225 but hold the single ride fare if you're using Clipper at $2 something that many other systems have done, that we, we would need to make sure that people have access to clippers and to the ability to reload them, that it doesn't create any disproportionate impact to any communities, but that would be a, a way to try to encourage more people to not use cash. There's a cost to us as an agency, uh, the more cash we have in the system, so the more we can move people to electronic payment, the better. And, and then the other big opportunity we have in the operating budget has to do with muni service. The transit effectiveness project, which I mentioned, which is really looking at uh, restructuring and improving muni service, is recommending a pretty significant increase in muni service. As any of you who know who ride muni, a lot of our lines are crowded, and there's a lot more demand for muni service than, than we have currently the service plan to deliver. So the TEP proposes uh, 10% increase in Muni service, so more service, particularly on the routes that carry the, the most people. But I think of the 75 or so Muni routes, the TEP proposes some increased frequency on about 60 of them. So it's almost a, a, a system-wide increase focused on the most heavily traveled routes, but 
pretty significant bump up in, in Muni service proposed uh, to reduce crowding, to, to make it uh, kind of faster and more efficient to move through the cities, which also would make it a more attractive means of travel for more trips for more people. But of course, that comes at a, at a pretty significant cost. That just this service increase would uh, more than consume those surpluses I showed in the baseline budget. So then, uh, quickly moving on to the capital budget. Uh, the, the capital budget is where we're making kind of one-time investments in the assets to bring them into a state of good repair, and that's the core priority of our budget uh, to make sure that the our kind of mission critical assets, which are the buses and the trains and the rails and the overhead wires and the signals and switches, making sure that those are in a state of good repair. That alone carries a price tag of about $250 million a year. We have about, I think it's $12 billion worth of assets, so we need to be investing in this level just to keep those core assets in a state of good repair. The other priority um, is safe and complete streets. I mentioned at the start the focus on bike and pedestrian safety, but, but really safety for all road users. There's investments we need to make or can make to make the, to redesign the streets to make them safer for all road users. That's a priority in this capital budget. And, and then the third, uh, and this relates back to the TEP, there are changes that we can make in the public right of way to make Muni work better through the streets, the dedicating lanes to Muni. Uh, bulbing out sidewalks so that the buses don't have to pull over to pick up passengers and then fight their way back into traffic, uh, putting in signals in some places where the muni vehicles have to stop and tying the muni vehicles to those signals so that they get a green light. So that's another category of investment. So the state of good repair, which is really investing in the system that we have today, safety, and then enhancements to the system that will help the system work better. So th this is what the, the revenues uh, and expenditures look like at the capital budget at kind of a big picture. You can see we, we get a, a pretty good chunk of our revenues from the federal government when it comes to the capital side of our budget. The, on the local side, we do have the half cent sales tax dedicated for transportation here in San Francisco. We at the MTA are the largest recipient of those funds. Um, there's a, a few other local sources, including our own uh, MTA revenue bonds that I referenced, and we get a little bit of money from the state too. You can see um, how, the, how this breaks down in terms of uses. Uh, the Central Subway is a federally funded program that, as I think everybody knows, is extending the T-third service uh, up through the most uh, densely populated part of the city. Um, there's a, a chunk that go to streets chunk that go to that what's called transit optimization, which is really making those changes in the right of way to help Muni work better. And then again, the core, um, and th these are five-year numbers. This is the five-year CIP number, so it's about three billion over five years. Uh, but the core of that um, over the five years is that state of good repair, that $250 million a year we need to continually invest to bring the system into good condition. Uh, the good news is that uh, from the last time we did this exercise, the, the five-year picture is, is looking better. Um, it's going up from two and a half to, to over three. The, the central subway portion is actually shrinking a little bit because that project is underway and we've already expended some of the funding there. Uh, but you can see a lot more room for investment in fleet. Um, we, you've already seen 100 new buses hit the streets over this, the course of this five-year period. <laughs> Uh, almost the entire balance of the bus fleet, another 700 buses, uh, we believe will have the funds to replace. So we should have a whole new Muni fleet by the end of this five-year period, which is, which is great. Um, and then a considerably more money, almost a tripling with regard to streets, the safety improvements for bikes and pedestrians, um, as, as well as a, a little bit more money to, for the, that optimization of making the improvements in the streets for transit. And one of the things that's driving that big bump up is uh, what's shown here is TTF over on the right side. And these are based on the recommendations of the mayor's transportation task force that he convened last year. What that task force recommended after looking at the state of transportation in San Francisco was about nearly $3 billion of new local revenues uh, primarily focused on state of good repair and enhancing 
bike, pedestrian, and transit access in the city uh, through a, a, a few different uh, mechanisms, uh, two, two general obligation bonds, an increase in the vehicle license fee back up to where it was before it was cut about six or seven years ago, um, as well as an additional half cent sales tax increase. Those together would, would generate about $3 billion and the first uh, first, two, first few steps of that were recommended by the mayor in his State of the City speech this year, and that would be a $500 million general obligation bond and an increase in the vehicle license fee uh, this November on the ballot. Um, here are some of the things that uh, if these measures make it to the ballot and are approved, that we would be able to do. Um, it's not just uh, replacing the buses and trains, but increasing capacity so in some cases going from 46, 40 foot buses to 60 foot buses, increasing the number uh, of buses and light rail vehicles, uh, improving the investments in the right of way so that Muni can work better as it travels through it, that can increase travel times by up to 20% in some cases. Um, it will provide significant funding for uh, other uh, Muni infrastructure and particularly for bike and pedestrian safety measures that, that we all know are so uh, urgently needed, um, and it will enable us to, re to leverage regional funds. The region, region has already come forward and said, San Francisco, if, you, uh, if the voters approve these measures, we will match in part uh, with anticipated uh, cap and trade and other uh, state funds that would be coming through the region. They're saying we will direct those to San Francisco if San Franciscans step forward. So huge opportunity for us to really move the needle on the investments that we need to make to make the transportation system safer and more reliable and effective. So pretty exciting, uh, great leadership by the mayor pulling together the city family just like he did to address pension reform and housing reform and business tax reform to really address the transportation infrastructure. So where we're going from here, this is our uh, final public meeting. There's still opportunity to provide comments uh, through our website, through email, through, through Twitter. Um, but from here, we go to uh, a first kind of rough proposed budget next Friday, March 14th, uh, at the MTA board. Uh, we'll also at that meeting be hearing about the service changes recommended by the Transit Effectiveness Project. Two weeks later, those service changes will be before the board for approval on March 28th. Uh, this says TBD, I think that's also a 9 a.m. meeting on the 28th. Uh, from there, uh, on, April, on April 1st, uh, at a regular Tuesday board meeting of the MTA board will be their first opportunity to vote on the proposed budget, and that'll be based on the feedback we've gotten through this process and based on feedback for whatever we end up proposing on March 14th. If they can't come to agreement on the first or if they have other questions, they have a second opportunity on April 15th. Uh, if they can't come to agreement then, we, we would have to schedule another meeting because the charter requires us to complete and submit a budget to City Hall by May 1st. Um, and then the Board of Supervisors uh, have an opportunity to review during the course of May, June, and July, um, at which point we would have our budget in place for the next two fiscal years. So I probably took a little bit more time than I should have. Um, I'll end there, and the rest of the time is yours. I welcome questions, feedback, comments. We are uh, streaming this uh, with SFGov TV, and I should thank SFGov TV for supporting these events. I want to thank all the MTA staff who have been supporting these events. Uh, so th there is a microphone that we would prefer you to use. Uh, if you don't want to, you can shout and I'll repeat your question. But so the folks who might be watching remotely can hear you, we'd like you to use the mic. And the floor is yours. I'm Bob Planthold. I do have a question about two revenue measures but you also raised other topics and asked for feedback on the possibility of a separate surcharge for express buses. I just want to call your attention that 20 years ago, then Supervisor Tom Shea pushed through some fare change measures that included a surcharge for express buses. It also eliminated transfers. There was a dramatic decrease in revenue and ridership. So I ask you to look at that history from 20 some years ago when there was a surcharge, even Muni staff said then that the Muni was an integrated system and that expresses weren't necessarily separate from on top of as, as a luxury service. Okay. I 
want people to know that we heard Thursday MTA is now planning to pay about $20 to cab drivers to pick up people with disabilities because there's so few ramp taxis out there. I read that there's a calculation that would cost several million dollars that's new extra money contemplated from this surcharge. At the same time, we hear the mayor wants to end Sunday parking charges from parking meters. Staff would not answer my question. They said, ask you, is there a recommendation? And here's what's bothersome. That amount of foregone revenue is comparable to what's going to be needed to pay the surcharge to cab drivers. We haven't heard anything about this other than the mayor wants to figuratively give people a break. There's a pro-Christian bias in that. Sunday is the Sabbath for many Christians, but those who are Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Seventh-day Baptists, Seventh-day Anabaptists, Adventists, have a different Sabbath. They're not getting a break. Has Muni looked at what it might cost to defend a lawsuit if you decide to forego parking meter revenue? And when we're talking about pedestrian safety, and bicycle safety, and improved roadway safety. The mayor's saying there's so much extra money coming in from Sunday parking because of the tickets people get from not paying the meters. So the mayor wants to reward drivers for not paying attention, for not reading the sign. He wants to reward people for being oblivious. That seems counterintuitive to pedestrian safety. Does staff plan to make a recommendation about Sunday parking, meter charges, and where will you get the money for the taxi surcharge to help pick up people with disabilities? And also, do you plan to put aside money for a lawsuit about religious bias if the board passes what the mayor wants? Um, so good questions. Uh, with, with regard, I don't believe that the uh, incentive payments that we're offering to taxi drivers would uh, result in the volumes that you're talking about. But uh, uh, it's something that we've, we believe, get, given the, the revenues that we get from the taxi system, that, that we can support. With regard to Sunday parking, uh, the Board of Directors uh, adopted the enforcement of meters on Sundays two years ago uh, because uh, as opposed to when parking meters first went in in the 50s and 60s, uh, Sundays now are very much a day of commercial activity, very similar to Saturdays. Um, it was meant to facilitate availability of parking, uh, to support commercial activity that, that does happen now on Sundays, as well as to reduce the congestion of people spending their time circling the streets looking for parking spaces. Based on our analysis, the availability uh, has indeed increased as a result of Sunday parking enforcement, so it's been effective in achieving that policy goal. Uh, with regard to the legal analysis of religious discrimination, we have not undertaken that analysis. Uh, we, we did have previously no meter enforcement on Sundays. Um, it's something that I suppose that we could look into. In terms of what I'm going to recommend to the board, uh, I haven't decided yet. I have, I have a couple of days uh, before I need to do that. Um, I have talked uh, with the mayor a little bit about this to try to understand um, where he's coming from. I've talked to, to board members. I imagine we may have some discussion about that on March 14th, but it's still a, an issue in play. I think the policy justifications for it still hold and have been validated, uh, but I also understand that you know, people don't like it. Um, so those are things that we have to, we have to balance. Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I came here with a very grave concern, which you may have already addressed. Uh, I took an unpaid day off of work to come here, and uh, so it may be addressed, but I think uh, I, it's about the big increase on the F line. And the reason I still want to read my brief statement is because I think the fact that that proposal even got into the budget indicates there's some insensitivity about people in my situation. So I wanna, would like to read my situation. Uh, I'm a senior who supplement my social security income with a job in Oakland four days a week. I depend on the F line to save me the 2.4 mile round trip walk to BART, which is too much for me on a regular basis. 
as well as unsafe at night, uh, increasing the fare by, uh, well, the proposal was as much as 800%, uh, would create a financial hardship for me, as well as a threat to my safety due to the fact that I don't get off BART until after dark and currently count on being able to catch the F-Line adjacent to the Bark Embarcadero station. That, and that takes that to Pier 23. Um, an 800% increase would cost me $192 per month, not including BART fees, and would create a threat to my current lifestyle. Um, so I, I did want to make this statement, which means the total cost, and I know that proposal will probably not go through, but the total cost would be uh, $230.40 a month for me to do a four-day job from San Francisco to Oakland. And so I just wanted to really make the point, and, and you said it's not going to happen. Um, I think uh, whoever made this proposal should be aware of what a dire consequence it has on people like me. And that's when I wanted to tell my story on behalf of myself and everybody else who is in a similar situation. I'm at Lombard and Sans and the 10 line is gone, so there's no options. Yeah, no, I understand. And I appreciate we've gotten a lot of feedback like that. I mean, part of the logic, just so, so you know, is that in, in your circumstance, for example, $24 a month, you'd have a fast pass that would give you unlimited access to the F and all the other muni service. Um, that would not be impacted if we were to raise the single cash fare. But I've heard from a lot of people that they don't get fast passes, but they do use the F line for their regular transit. And so that's why I so think the, we won't it, be advancing. The fast pass would be available at the BART station. Uh, where would I get the fast pass? Yeah, so the fast pass you can get uh, online, you can get uh, at the BART station on a clipper card. Okay. Um, and if that might be a good option for you anyway. So I don't have to worry then. Right. Okay. One thing I've noticed in your budget is there's no addition to the size of the Muni fleet. It remains the same. True, uh, vehicles are being replaced, but the size of the fleet will not grow. Now, to me, this appears to be unrealistic because the population of the city has grown. Also, the demand has grown. And I would have nothing against the Transit Effectiveness Project if one, they would, you know, okay, you can put increased vehicles on the most heavily used routes, but please spare the neighborhoods. Don't take away the buses from the neighborhoods. Those are desperately needed. And one of the real questions of the Transit Effectiveness Project is accessibility to public transportation. When people have to walk blocks to get a bus, and many of uh, the population in the city is elderly, they're disabled, some are severely ill, this poses a hardship. And the Transit Effectiveness Project does not recognize this. Also, the budget does not recognize this. So the thing about it is, I think more money is needed for uh, the municipal railway. This is a transit-first city, after all. This should be the top priority. Unfortunately, when cuts are made, it's always transit-first. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so I agree. I think we, we do need more muni service, and there's really three ways, at least, by which we're proposing to achieve that. Uh, one is by continuing to invest in the maintenance of the system so that at any given time, we have more buses and trains out in the street as opposed to in the shop. That alone uh, creates more muni service. Um, second, uh, the, uh, the TEP, as I mentioned, is recommending a 10% service increase, just with the existing fleet, just running more frequency, in some cases uh, enabled by physical changes in the streets that allow the buses to make their trip, uh, and the trains to make their trip more, more quickly, so they can circle back and they can provide more service with the same fleet. And then also, as I mentioned, and perhaps it wasn't clear, uh, with the ballot measures proposed for November, that would also allow us to increase the fleet, not just the number of buses, but in, in some cases the size, as I said, moving from 40 to 60 foot buses. So three different dimensions there by which we would be actually increasing the service to keep up with population growth, as you mentioned. Also, uh, we feel like there's probably a lot of latent demand out there that if that Muni was more reliable, 
um, and a better choice that more people today, even if not a single person new came to San Francisco, more people would ride Muni if they felt it was a good way for, that, for them to get around. And then with regard to, to stops, I understand that stop spacing is a very sensitive issue. The, the TEP recommendations, even if they were kind of fully accepted, uh, would maintain something like 97% of the existing bus stops. And right now we have probably the, the densest provision of bus stops of any city in the country. Something like 90% of all residences in San Francisco are within two blocks of a muni stop. We'd be, we're proposing in the TEP to maintain 97 some percent of those. Uh, and even of those 3% that are left, as we go through the community process for each specific line, uh, we would likely uh, or, or may add some stops back as we did during the 5L pilot. So I agree with your points. We need more transit service. We need to be sensitive on stop spacing. And uh, we need to remember that we're a transit first city. Please don't hurt the neighborhoods and the physically frail. Well, since we're getting uh, Google to pay for some of our uh, programs, maybe they should be on the uh, MTA board. What do you think? Uh, I'd rather just have their money. Okay, yes. Uh, Safety has been uh, highlighted in your presentation. However, we still don't have an independent transit security system for the Muni. Now, I keep on hearing the myth that the police department are involved, but I don't think anybody really believes that they're going to provide the amount of safety necessary. I know a little bit about this because I was a transit operator for over 30 years. If you get on some lines, there's absolutely no way people are going to feel safe. I mean, that's just pure and simple. And I operated buses. I operated in the Mission. I operated on Market Street, nighttime. There are people who are riding these buses who have absolutely no respect for the rules or anything. If people are boarding through the back door, this is what I've seen, cans of gasoline, dogs without muzzles, pit bull without a muzzle, people eating, bringing uh, cans of beer. When you get on a bus for many people, it's trash back there. People leaving their trash, eating on a bus, spilling food on the seats. It makes us look terrible for visitors. Now, if there are a dedicated police force, which I know is expensive and I don't think it's ever going to happen, maybe some of these people could be cited and maybe the word would get around that the muni is not a free-for-all for your indulgent lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I think uh, the security uh, on the muni buses, including for the operators themselves, is, is definitely an issue that we've been focusing on. We, we did in the last budget increase the number of fare inspectors as well as the number of ambassadors, the Muni Transit Assistance Program. And more recently, we've been working with the police department to change how they deploy the resources on the buses. We've been using a, it's basically a surge model when there's been a lot more police presence on the buses since about October, November. And as a result, we've seen incidents of theft and robbery really plummet in the last couple of months. So. I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of bad behaviors uh, on the vehicles that, that we need to address. We're trying through a number of different paths with people in different kinds of uniforms having more of a presence on the vehicles to, to try to address that. I think some of it is also a, some behavioral change that, that we need to try to work at as well as because we're never going to have enough uniform presence to, to be on every vehicle all the time. So there's a, I think we need to change the, the tone and the feel of being on a muni bus. And part of it, uh, part of this structural deficit that I talked about is having enough car cleaners to keep the vehicles clean so that when you walk on the bus, it's a clean and inviting environment and not one that might be conducive to eating and littering and, and the rest that contribute to that atmosphere that you're talking about. Well, seldom is there a better uh, mitigating factor for, for behavior than getting cited. Uh, I think an operator was knew if he or she was pulled up to 16th and Mission or Van Ness and Market or 3rd and Palou or some major transit areas, uh, connecting areas, that there was going to be security people there. And if they had a problem, they could call those people over and that person could be removed from the, from the equipment. I think we can't depend on the police department. We have to have a dedicated service under the police department that is only for the Muni. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Bobby. I've been a disabled passenger for over 30 years. Um, to quote my brother passenger, the rewards for obliviousness um, include 
that the 27 Bryant line is being condensed into the 12 Folsom line. The Potrero buses are being condensed into the 9 San Bruno. That's a polite way of saying lines on Bryant and Potrero are being cut. The 26 Valencia is long gone. Um, as a resident, sometimes sleeping in doorways in the mission, um, seniors and disabled, um, it's a terrifying experience to be on a really crowded bus. If you cut the Bryant line claiming that you're condensing it for efficiency, if, you if you've, you've already cut the 26 Valencia, if you cut the Potrero buses, all the buses in the neighborhoods were working class, poverty class, seniors and disabled are trying to live and work. A, people's elbows in your neck, backpack is, back, in your ribs, you climb over the wheelchairs to get to your seat. It's a terrifying experience for disabled people on the currently overcrowded lines. If you cut the lines in the working class, poverty class neighborhoods even further, um, currently you have to do at least two transfers to get from one part of the city to the other. If you have to do long walks and long waits and continue to, if you continue to cut or condense, um, you're, you're living in Disneyland. You're not oblivious, you're delusional. Seniors and disabled um, students, other people on fixed limited incomes, um, you can't condense the, the Bryant into the Folsom. It means cutting buses on Bryant. You can't condense the buses on Potrero into the 9 San Bruno. It means cutting buses in those areas. The Valencia bus is already gone. It's a terrifying experience for seniors and disabled to climb over wheelchairs, to have elbows in their neck, backpacks in their faces. The drivers should not have to be police for violent behavior. Um, the little guys in the lime green vests, if your transfer is expired by three minutes, there's a $106 fine but if somebody has knives or guns or other violent behavior, you can't find security. Secu yeah, so Six or seven people at the bus stops will charge you a citation, uh, charge you a fine if your um, clipper pass doesn't have cash on it because most people that I've talked to don't understand that if you put money on the BART part, it doesn't put money on the Muni part. Most seniors and many disabled still don't understand how Clipper works. So if you condense, in other words, cut lines on Bryant and Valencia and Potrero, that means two or three transfers instead of one or two transfers. Um, and these lines are already overcrowded. It yeah, so we've gotten a lot of feedback on, on some of those particular cut pr those proposals. Lines. And, and, anything, and increase those lines. Right, so, so this is why we, we go through a public process so that we can explain kind of the thinking, but we can get feedback. And we've gotten a lot uh, along the lines of what you said. So there we, is no we, thinking. We, You're we, oblivious. We, You're delusional. Okay, well, well, I appreciate that feedback. It, it will help us to do better as we finalize these recommend, recommendations and bring them to our board. Thank you for a public forum where you pretend you give a shit. Hello. My name is Shirley Johnson, and I live in the Mission. And we've heard a lot about really busy buses, crowded buses, latent demand for buses. And I ride a bike. And there are a lot of people just like me that ride a bike. And we would like to not take the seats for the buses that people need. And people look at me and say, wow, you ride a bike all over the city. Aren't you afraid? And I'm very experienced. And yes, sometimes I'm afraid. But there are a lot of people who would ride more if they felt safer. And that would free up spaces on the buses. There's latent demand for bikes. I know there is. So I would encourage you to increase safety for bicycles, pedestrians as well, of course. And bicycles and pedestrians are very, very clean. We don't create any pollution. We're very, very clean. And also, the buses, frankly, are slower than riding a bike. So those who are able to ride a bike, if they felt safer, they would get out of the bus, get their backpacks out of people's <laughs> uh, sides and elbows out of people's faces, and get them on a bike. That would be much better. I used to live in Holland. And there, the policy is that they make it easier to bike somewhere than to drive somewhere. 
They do that by putting a lot of one-way streets, a lot of bollards in the streets. So I think if we look at that to try to get people out of transit and into bikes, into walking, into biking, that would be much better. So I would encourage you to try to increase your bicycle safety and bicycle funding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and you make a great point. Uh, every person on a bike is, is one less person uh, on the bus or, or, or worse in a car taking up space on the street or parking space from someone who really needs it. Uh, so we see that the more people we can get on bikes is very complementary to the transit first policy and part of how we're going to achieve the, the goals that we have in terms of people, how people get around the city particularly as we see growth coming to the city, we can't have everybody coming and driving their own car. So the more people that are on bikes, that are walking, that are on transit, the better city this will be. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jerry Cawthon. I guess I'm representing Save Muni today. Uh, you mentioned that with the same fleet, you are going to be able to improve service by several good ideas, such as improving the maintenance, and also by street changes that would enhance muni operations along those streets. Now, there's going to be a lot of opinions and priorities as to how you make those street changes. A lot of us feel that the muni that carries 700,000 people a day is probably going to jump to, who knows, 950 million riders a day in 20 years or so. That's a very, very high priority. So make it, the street changes ought to make the muni better. It shouldn't impede it. Now, I was on a number five bus westbound uh, a couple of weeks ago, going from uh, from uh, Van Ness up to Fillmore, slight hill, very short, one lane west, right in the middle of that single lane is a bike lane, painted in there, parked cars all along the side, so that we, uh, we were behind about six, maybe seven bicyclists who were having a little trouble with that hill, even though it's very, almost flat, running about six miles an hour, I was on a limited that normally should go 20 miles an hour, it's creeping along. I asked the bus driver, I said, does this happen? Is this odd or is this happen? He said, every day, every afternoon during the peak, the limited is shut down to six miles an hour for those bicycles. Now, the war should not be between Muni and the bicycles. It ought to be between the Muni plus the bicycles and too many cars in the way. Now, that sort of brings me to a second point, and that is that there are very few opportunities to actually decrease the number of cars, short of sort of draconian things like huge parking fees and congestion pricing. You can't have congestion pricing unless there's a really good alternative to driving, and that's the whole thing's kind of circular, because the transit systems need to get fixed, and then you might be reasonable to ask for some kind of fair congestion pricing. One of the projects that would have the biggest, uh, biggest potential for fixing that in the entire region would be to extend Caltrain to the new terminal and extend underground moving ramps from the mezzanine level of the new terminal right into the Embarcadale Station and the Market Street. Now you can look at those 200,000 cars a day that get dumped on San Francisco streets by, Cal by uh, the peninsula and say, okay, folks, you've now got a really high-class alternative way of traveling. And by the way, it goes out of the city as well as in. My son lives up on, near Masonic on Fulton. He, he drives to Mountain View every day because it takes him an hour to get by Muni to Caltrain. And so he won't use Caltrain. I said, well, this is a great ride once you get there. He won't use it. And that's, that's critical that Caltrain be given a much higher priority by this city than it has so far. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree. Supporting Caltrain electrification, supporting the downtown extension. I mean, th those are really the city's top priorities for the region in terms of transportation access. And with regard to b bike versus transit, we don't want wars with anybody. Um, that there are, in, we're currently in the process of developing what we call a modal hierarchy, uh, where we would try to identify which streets are better for transit versus for bike, for, for other means and, and in some places we're able to do that um, because of the topography of the city in some places the streets that are best for muni are also the ones that happen to be best for bikes and that's where we'll try to use design as much as we can to deconflict the two of but it's a point San well Francisco taken was not amsterdam and it never will be and you, you can't do the things that they were able to do there it just is not the space for it but we're definitely I we're, we're, a, we're a different city and we need to account for that different those differences streets for bikes from transit makes a whole lot of sense yeah. thank you thank you 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Henry Pan, and uh, some comments for you today. For one, I support youth fair for 18-year-olds. As a former high schooler who turned 18 while I was still in school, the last couple months of high school were kind of perilous to me because I didn't have an adequate way to get around and couldn't really afford it. But that was before I got a bike. So, And um, another comment I want to make with respect to transit is that Muni needs more operations funding. There's a good amount of um, funding set aside for capital, but there's not really much point of having capital funding if you can, well, there's not really much point of building it and having all these buses if there, there's no money to maintain all the infrastructure. And I would support keeping Sunday meters to fund the operations and other aspects of muni operations. And I'm not sure whether anybody else has brought this up, but I support the implementation of evening meters in commercial areas, not necessarily residential, but commercial areas. And I really would, up till like 10 p.m. at the very least. So I make a note of that. And uh, what else is there? Um, and I would also support an increase of bicycle funding because the city is growing. Muni at the moment can't handle all these extra influxes of passengers. So bicycling is the way to go. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just, just I, I agree with uh, most of what you said there. Um, I will say with regard to the more operating funding versus more capital funding, I uh, mean, our, our operating funds have grown pretty significantly. This year we have a, I think, $850 million uh, operating budget. So next year it's looking like 930, 950 the next year. So it's, that's growing pretty fast in part because of the health of the economy and the general fund. Um, on the capital side, we've identified, even if all of these revenue measures that the mayor has recommended, all 2.9 billion are, are pa approved by the voters. We still, in the next 15 years, have another $3.3 billion gap to close. So even if all this happens, we still haven't closed the gap. So I, I'd probably respectfully disagree that there's plenty of money for capital. We should throw some at operating. And I, I would also suggest, uh, we're not talking about capital really to build new stuff, it's to maintain what we have. And I see it more, I think there's an analogy to your house. If you have a house that doesn't have a strong foundation and the wiring isn't in good shape and the plumbing's not in good shape, uh, the first thing you shouldn't do, or the first thing you should, sh should do shouldn't be to build an addition to the house so that you have a bigger house that's not in good condition. The first thing you need to do is fix the foundation and repair the wiring and the plumbing. That to me is kind of the approach of we need to make the capital investment in the existing system so that it can support better service. And just by doing that, even without adding a single bus or driver, we'll be able to provide more service because again, the buses and trains will be out on the street delivering service, not in the shop having broken down. And instead of paying emergency crews to go in, out in a truck and, and tow a bus into the yard after it broke down, we'd be able to take those same dollars and hire more bus drivers. So I think the capital investment is really a critical part that will enable us to inc improve the service and then to, to add more to it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Bigelow. I primarily came up to say thank you, number one, for your leadership. Uh, I think you've done a really excellent job in outlining a, a strategy to bring Muni to, uh, an, well, our streets overall into a, a better place. Um, but with that, I did want to implore you to continue that leadership, especially with respect to Sunday meters. Um, we really need to continue the policy because it's actually just good policy for businesses, for residents, and for the majority of us who aren't parking at a particular Sunday meter. Um, it's, a, it's a good idea. With respect to that, and something perhaps more controversial would have to do with expanding meters or taking a look at where I know it's controversial to talk about handshake agreements. The SFMTA is not enforcing, uh, for instance, parking in the public right of way on Dolores, on Guerrero, uh, in these areas on Sundays and actually on Saturdays as well for some of the, the Jewish uh, institutions in the area. It's important and it's something that we should talk about whether we want to do that as opposed to simply saying it's happened in the past. Um, if that's gonna be the trade-off the city makes, we should have a conscious decision and discussion about it. Um, but overall, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, great points, thank you. 
Excuse me? Yeah, you can, uh, there's a, a desk at the back on your way out uh, for those who have surveys, or this young man will come and take them for you. Yes, sir. My name is Brent Paradise. I live here in the city. I have not owned a car since 1972. Wow. A year before the Transit First policy was adopted, you were ahead of your time. I notice a great deal of non-fare collection on the buses and the streetcars, and I ride two or three times a day. This new backdoor policy, I think, is costing us a great deal of money. I've heard rumors that with the new ticket police, the Muni ticket police, we're collecting $1 for every $4 we're spending. I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. Yeah, so with regard to fare collection and, and fare evasion, um, we did an analysis uh, a number of years ago that estimated that we're losing about $19 million a year. So our fares are about $200 million a year, so a, a pretty good percent uh, we estimated that we were losing for people who are not paying their fares. Uh, we did uh, think about that very cautiously as we were thinking about all door boarding, uh, which, which you made reference to, which we started last year. We, we did, as I mentioned, we increased the number of fare inspectors by about 20%. Uh, we have been uh, warning and citing a lot more people uh, as a result. Um, but I will say that our, our fare revenues have not did, did not decline uh, when we went to all door boarding. Uh, there are a lot more people who have passes and clipper cards. So uh, just because, although we want people with a clipper card even with a pass to, to tap on in the back door, uh, many of them don't. So it, fr from the contacts that our fare inspectors make, they, they find a, a much lower fare evasion rate than that 9% that we found a few years ago. They're finding somewhere between three and 5%. Now, in part, that's because some people leave when they see the fare inspectors coming, so I, I understand that. So we do have to balance. We pay, I think, about four or five million for our fare inspection program, and that's against the, you know, maybe eight or nine million loss of revenue. So there is a point at which it becomes not, a, you know, all that effective. I don't think we'll increase that force anymore. Um, I think their presence on the vehicles, aside from the extent to which they're helping to make sure everybody pays their fare fare, their presence also helps with some of those security issues that, that we referenced earlier. So there's more benefit I think we get than just the fair collection, but it, it, it remains a challenge and uh, we're trying to make it easier for people to get the fair instruments and make sure that everybody who should be paying is paying because it's fair for everybody. And as you saw, it's a big chunk of our revenues. A quarter of the agency's budget comes from transit fares. presentation. Um, my name is Gail, and most of the things that I came here for have been covered uh, very well by both uh, the people here and yourself. But uh, I have some things that I'd like to talk about that probably sound a little petty, but uh, things like uh, maintenance. Uh, there were a series of articles in the San Francisco that's a uh, uh, weekly thing by Esther Hazy, I think, uh, that talked about how maintenance is really awful at Muni, uh, and one of the things that the, uh, Muni does is they turn on the buses and let them idle for like about four or five hours before they go out, which is a huge waste of fuel, and uh, uh, wear and tear on the bus itself. That's number one, and also when I'm on Geary Street, I'm always amazed at the amount of empty out of service buses that are going in both directions and I don't understand why uh, they cannot pick up passengers and have it said at the at the uh, where you know the sign at the beginning where they're going to end so people have a choice of, of at least riding those buses because that's another huge waste of fuel and um, also, uh, another thing that um, I find a little upsetting, but I understand Muni has time constraints, but at cross, cross areas, major cross areas, uh, buses see, or streetcar, they see uh, the other uh, vehicle coming in the opposite direction, you know, in the uh, crossing direction, and they don't wait. There's always people that want to make that connection. Now, as I say, I do understand the, the time constraints, but even so, when they see people are getting off the bus and waving and, you know, wait, wait, and they just take off, 
Uh, I think that's uh, very uneconomical and very callous, actually. Uh, and I think, <laughs> I guess that's about all that I have. Uh, oh, yeah. That's about it. Yeah, those are, those are all, all very good points. I appreciate them. Uh, with regard to maintenance of the vehicles generally, or maintenance generally, um, I agree. It, it's not an area that we've invested what we should have been investing. Uh, we, we made a big step towards that in the last budget. I hope to add more maintenance resources in this budget. Um, as we looked at that baseline surplus, that's one of the things on the table to improve the maintenance of the buses. Uh, with regard to the idling, the the Part of what you're seeing there is the warm-up period of buses or buses that are being cleaned and maintained, but, but he was correct in his article. There were some subset of buses that were being started longer than they should have, earlier than they should have been, um, that was counter to the agency's policy, and I appreciate the fact that he wrote that article because we've been able to since correct that. In terms of buses who are, that are going out of service to the Presidio Yard on Geary, uh, up to a point they should be uh, taking passengers and uh, some operators are, yeah, so some of, to some extent that's happening, to some extent it's not, so that's, that's something that shouldn't be happening. We should be using those buses as, as much as we can. And then, as you mentioned, in terms of waiting for people who are transferring to get on the bus, the operators have, have a, are operating in a very difficult environment. The schedules are pretty tight, so they're making judgments all the time. Many times they will wait. Um, but if they've got a full bus, they're behind schedule, uh, and sometimes they know that there's a bus coming close behind, they will sometimes make the choice to leave. I know it can be very frustrating when I'm running for a bus and I see it pull away, um, but that's a, a, a trade-off that the operators do have to sometimes make. Thank you. First of all, thank you for taking your Saturday and um, to uh, be transparent about the budget process and appreciate the leadership that you've exhibited the last couple years. And, and MTA's efforts to improve uh, reliability. A um, couple things I wanted to comment on. Um, wanted to uh, make a point about Sunday meters. Um, I know you mentioned you're going to be making a, a recommendation in a couple of days. Um, you, you've echoed today that you believe this, the sound policy arguments in favor of Sunday meters still are valid. In fact, are strengthened by the evidence we, we have in neighborhoods. And I hope. Uh, to see you continue to, your leadership and stay strong in supporting sound policy over politics. It's just bad um, to, to regress uh, back um, just because the, the mayor or his team thinks it's uh, politically expedient. I, I think we, this is a perfect example where policy needs to win over politics. So I, I hope to see a, a strong recommendation from you and the board uh, to retain uh, and, and uh, uh, Sunday parking meters. Um, I also applaud um, efforts from your agency to uh, implement the principles of complete streets. And I know there's a little talk, lots to talk about uh, the goals of Vision Zero. Um, I applaud the attention um, you have been paying to pedestrian and bicycle safety in the city. Um, the budget is the most important reflection of, of our priorities and principles. And the more we can fund uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements, it, it's, it can only help Muni. Um, I am on the founding executive team of a company called Public. Uh, we design bikes for urban transportation, and we employ a couple dozen people. Um, I've seen even on Market Street, the changes that are being made on Market Street, there's at least three bike shops that have opened up in the last few years between 11th and um, the ferry building. That's a perfect example of those bike shops wouldn't necessarily locate on Market Street or create the jobs they do if it wasn't for the changes we've made on Market Street. So I encourage the MTA to continue to make uh, Market Street a world-class corridor that focus on public transit, bicycles, and pedestrians, and active um, commercial corridors. Um, the, one of the most biggest detriments, as we know, to mini reliability is just the congestion of car vehicles in, um, in, on our streets. So anything we can do to continue to our transit uh, priorities uh, would be helpful. And uh, just, a, just a, 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 a few specific examples in my own personal life and my commute. I live um, right near the DMV, and I live right on Oak Street, right where the new Oak, Oak Bikeway is. It's, it's a tremendous uh, safety improvement for a major corridor. So I encourage you to continue to improve on Fell and Oak. I know um, the, the, the bike lanes are there, but I know there's plans, I think, to have some type of um, 
barriers, physical barriers on there. I, I'd like to see that implemented sooner than later. Hopefully, I'd, I'd love to hear what the timeline on that it would be. Um, but a perfect example, like I, I, you know, I and along with thousands of people ride our, my bike, walk, take transit on Market Street. The improvement you made on Folsom Street, significant safety. Now I actually have a choice between going on Market or Folsom because in, instead of Folsom being a death trap for me and many thousands of bicyclists for, for years, just the simple um, separated bikeway um, in the last uh, year or last six months or so has uh, made it tremendously uh, safer for many of us. So uh, once again, continue uh, to make the improvements you did and I appreciate the work you do. Yeah, thank you. I, I think the Felon Oak should be coming this summer, the, the, the balance of the project. Uh, we're also looking at doing on Howard what we did on Folsom. For all, I, I agree with all the things that you were talking about. We need strong public support for So I encourage folks who, who want to see things like that happen to, to come out and support publicly. Uh, I think I, I recognize the t-shirt, so I think I know what you guys are talking about. We do have just a few minutes left if you can try to be concise, but thank you for coming. Hi, my name is Shirley Tsai. I'm from the organization Chinatown Community Development Center. I would like to say that it is important to expand the um, free meeting for youth programs to include 18-year-old because a lot of 18-year-olds are still high school seniors and they don't have a job and they're still they're in low income. A lot of them and um, they're, it's somewhat a burden for their family to afford the. Uh, transportation fee for them to ride uh, public transportation in order to get to school or to other places. So I would like to say that it, um, I would like MTA to consider putting some of the budgets into this project. Okay, thank you. Well, my name is Annie and I'm from a low-income family. I'm re First of all, I'm really glad that Google can donate us money for the next two years. Me too. Yeah, for Free Muni for You. But uh, <coughs> it's really nice to say that Free Muni for You has impact for a lot. It's really impactful for over 30,000 of youth that can use in Free Muni every day that they go to school. But then um, it's, I think it's also important for the program to extend it for the Free Muni, free muni for Senior and Disabilities people. They use, uh, I mean, Every day I go to school, I, I use Muni, and I saw a lot of seniors. They use Muni really often, like every day. It's like they're king. Without it, they cannot go anywhere. So, but then maybe sometimes the cost would be too high for them. So, and yeah, I think it's good for you guys to consider that to extend it for, like, I mean, make it, make it free for the people that are seniors and disabilities. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, last two quick comments. We're just about out of time here. Hi. Hey, Fan. Uh, I'm pedestrian in Chinatown, and I, as, I want to, um, you guys to put more budget on the pedestrian safety, because me as a pedestrian, I saw many like other pedestrian like uh, cars, they, um, they see many dangerous um, experience I have. And then because of like, there's no policy for like, I'm not sure you didn't have policy for like, the cars have like, when they can turn, they, turn because I see many when there's like green light or red light and then potential walk uh, or walk across the, um, the street and then the car just turn just almost hit that like pedestrian so I want you guys to pay more attention to the pedestrian safety and then like I want to see the improvement like, as soon as possible yeah thank you I mean there, there actually are policies and rules about when cars can turn when there are people in a crosswalk and they pedestrians always have the right of way so part of what we're doing is working with the police department to have more enforcement out there so that when people aren't respecting that law that, that they get cited. Thank you. I'm, I'm so, uh, sorry, I, I didn't speak. Okay, let me uh, restate. Hello, my name's Roger Kempton and I uh, live uh, by City College. Uh, I take the Muni uh, and the BART and, uh, and the uh, topic is like the 43 uh, Masonic on northbound, uh, when it comes to uh, rebuilt uh, buses, uh, well, I have no problem. Uh, the uh, new color is a thing. The uh, secondary print uh, of the destined, final destination sign, when it's destined to uh, Marina uh, District, uh, the thing says uh, Marina Middle School. Uh, sometimes I think that's the wrong uh, 
message because uh, at Meridian Middle School uh, is not open 20, it's not a 24 7 thing, and uh, to uh, uh, go to inside the middle school, uh, have to have a legitimate uh, business. Outside that, uh, the district surrounding it, uh, not necessarily. Uh, and uh, and uh, to me, uh, and, uh, and also uh, middle school uh, is the youth. Uh, it's uh, not like City College or uh, uh, SF State University. Uh, yeah, I understand. We'll, we'll take a look at that. I'm not sure what, why it says Marina Middle School as opposed to Marina yes, District. Uh, Thank you. That's right. And also, uh, one more thing, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, celebrations uh, and uh, the, uh, the on eastbound, the inbound, uh, like 38 Geary, uh, destined for Transme Terminal. Uh, to me, uh, it bothers me because it's a partially false statement when it doesn't. It should say something uh, like uh, uh, Branton Market or Stockton Street at least uh, until uh, the shows on the street are over. I see. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, with regard to special events, there's work we need to do to change the destination signs based on, the, on any rerouting. So thank you. Final word. I got a question about the um, fares for the F line for six bucks. Now, since if it's going to be six bucks, yeah, I don't think we're going to advance that idea. I had mentioned earlier you may not have been here. I think uh, we've heard a lot of feedback from people that are explaining why that would be problematic. So okay. I don't believe I'm going to be recommending that to my board. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks to all the staff, and I'll, I'll be here. I think we're out of time, but I'll stay. Um, we'll end the formal meeting. I'm happy to answer any more questions down on the floor. Thank you all for coming.